have a presentation from Tecton Consultancy on a public safety building. Are there representatives? I see the chairman, if he'd like to join us at the table. And I don't know if your vice chair is here. I don't see him or if anybody else would like to join you so that you're not alone. <laughs> That's the sure, you want to do it concurrent? Yeah. <coughs> sure, can we also move up town manager item? Uh, 6A, please. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Aye. Aye. All those opposed, it is a vote. Okay. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman uh, and members of the board. Thank you for taking both of these items together, actually. So this evening, we actually have two parts to this uh, to this discussion. And this is related to the public safety feasibility study that began with uh, $150,000 appropriation from town meeting for the study in which we hired Tecton. And uh, they've done a tremendous job, and we'll be introducing them shortly. Uh, Tecton started their work approximately a year ago, uh, a year ago December, and around July they had done enough preliminary analysis that we felt it was important to appoint a committee of residents to look at the recommendations and the options that Tecton was uh, at that time evaluating and to work with Tecton and come back and make a recommendation to town administration. So I'm happy to say, and there is a memo in your packet related to this, that uh, I originally was thinking that we would appoint a five or seven member committee, but we have such enormous amount of interest in the committee, we actually appointed 11 members of the community to serve on this committee. And Kevin Kennedy was uh, unanimously elected at the first meeting um, to be the chair of it, so we thank Kevin for all his work and all of the committee. Uh, and there are some committee members in the audience this evening. They put a lot of work in, I'm gonna let Kevin talk about that, but there is a letter in your packet uh, from the committee with their recommendations on this, which I'll let Kevin explain. Then following this, we were going to have a presentation from the representatives of Tecton to just bring you up to speed for now as to where we are in this whole process. In your packets, and for anyone who's watching, we do have a proposed timeline in there. It is very, very preliminary because so many moving parts can change. So that timeline is really just to give you a general idea of how this process could work, uh, but any one of those timeline uh, items could move depending on another piece. So it is there really for just guidance. So uh, with that being said, I just would like to turn it over uh, to Kevin Kennedy, who's the chair of the committee, and have him discuss the recommendations. Mr. Kennedy. Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, so Tecton's gonna give you the bulk of the presentation with some of the details and the, the, the science behind uh, the facilities, but just a little bit about our group, which Julie said 11 members uh, representing the community, uh, diverse groups, some with uh, some public safety backgrounds, current public safety, past public safety. Uh, but the group got together, basically we, our mission was to evaluate the existing structures, the existing buildings, uh, look at them to see if they were uh, worthy of uh, investing money, if they, in their current capacity were sufficient, whether they needed some uh, investment, whether that investment was worthwhile for the uh, the taxpayers of the town, uh, based upon their current conditions. Uh, and if that was not the case, what would our options be for uh, facilities? Would a, uh, keeping the same, out, uh, same format that we have currently, a police, separate police facility and two fire facilities, or would we be looking towards uh, some combination uh, thereof. Uh, we started out by doing tours of the facilities. Uh, I thought I knew the public safety facilities fairly well and what they comprised of, but after getting tours from um, uh, the fire chief and police chief through the facilities, I realized that uh, I didn't know them all that well. Um, basically after touring those facilities, and I'll let the Tecton folks talk about uh, some of the, the details of what the facilities have to offer and some of their shortcomings, but we discovered through those tours that our existing facilities are, are not sufficient to meet the needs uh, currently, nor are they you know, for the future of our, our public safety in town. Uh, the police site was not sufficient, a uh, good facility, a young building per se in terms of uh, buildings. Uh, however, it is 
probably the day they moved in was too small and it is we all know where it's located and how it's sort of bordered by roadways that it was uh, it does not allow for expansion uh, the site is uh, is too small um, we looked at the current fire headquarters site the Auburn Street fire headquarters site uh, and saw that basically it was a great facility when it was opened, uh, but fire apparatus and fire advancement and um, all aspects of uh, fire safety that that facility is not uh, adequate for the apparatus, uh, the firefighters that work out of that facility, administration, storage, a whole uh, slew of things. Uh, and I'll let Tecton talk about some of the reasons why the site itself uh, is not going to be a viable site uh, for a replacement on that existing site. And then we looked at the uh, substation, the West Auburn Street substation over at the old uh, uh, Randall School, uh, for those of been around long enough to know what the, the Randall School, um, and basically that they inherited, uh, you know, an old school cafeteria and did great with it for the time, but uh, that one is uh, not sufficient in any way, shape, or manner as a current substation. So when we looked at that, we came away from those of our initial meetings to say that the current facilities nor the sites were adequate or uh, something that we'd be looking to invest in further for expansion, renovation. Um, so we looked and just made a determination through the meetings, what would our best option be? And the ideal option that we looked at, and I stress ideal, because things you know, could be subject to change, but the ideal option was a single public safety facility. Uh, and that would require a certain amount of acreage, certain amount of space for future needs uh, to build a, a single public safety, which would encompass uh, all of our fire um, entities within town, as well as the, uh, the police, uh, all in one one building. Uh, Deputy Chief uh, Johnson did a, quite a bit of work on his own relative to response times. That was a concern of ours relative if we were going to close one station and move other stations that no one within town would have to uh, be concerned with a, a change in response time the, for the levels of service to change. In fact, we would hope for improvement. Uh, so there was sort of a window of uh, space that we looked at for public sites. So basically now we were looking towards if we were to do this ideal public safety facility, combined facility, where would we locate that facility? So a list of sites were prevented, uh, presented to us. Uh, Tecton took uh, an initial look at some of those sites, made some determinations based on uh, the geographic uh, features of it, uh, waterways, um, access, uh, and kind of came back with some science for us on that. And we were able to eliminate some sites. Uh, some sites were put on the back burner as less than ideal. Um, all of the sites we looked at were determined initially to be along the Route 12 corridor. We did not do the Route 20 corridor in any way, shape, or form. We felt that was too busy of a roadway for emergency vehicles to be um, getting in and out of, out of that facility. Uh, so we looked at the, I think it was 11 sites in total maybe. 11 to 12, um, and came down with a uh, you know a list of sites uh, which uh, are included uh, in your packet there. Um, and the discussion you know they're, they're there as to what were the the pros of each site and the cons of each site. Uh, some were eliminated right away. Uh, I'll give an example being the the driving range uh, initially seems like a good site. It was within our uh, area of response times uh, for a good response times. However, quickly realized that the uh, town wells and aquifer and whatnot are, are, would be below that site, so that would not be a, a usable site. So that would have to be eliminated right away. Um, so that's sort of where we stood. Uh, basically, uh, we narrowed down some sites. We've uh, you've got all the sites before you there, uh, with our recommendations for a single public safety facility as, compo as opposed to the three separate um, facilities that we currently have. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, if, we'll, if you want, uh, however you want to proceed with this, if you want Tecton to do their presentation and we can do a combined uh, question and answer or... Uh, yeah. Sounds fine. Okay, before we go to the presentation, do you want to identify some of the board members? I see them all sitting in back. Uh, so, uh, so other uh, <laughs> committee members, and I thank you for attending. You've attended several of uh, of our meetings. Uh, we've got uh, 
J.D. Dowd is uh, here uh, as well as uh, Deputy Chief Johnson sits on the committee. Uh, retired uh, Police Lieutenant Mark Moss is uh, in the back row, and I think that's, uh, and obviously uh, Lieutenant Lemon is uh, representative of uh, the police station, doesn't actually sit as a member of the committee, but he has uh, been an integral figure as far as um, getting information relative to the police station site. Okay. Chief, Chief Coleman? Chief Coleman over my left shoulder on the fire department. <laughs> He's going to kick it off, I hear. Tonight. So, Mr. Chairman, I, um, I will introduce uh, the members of Tecton. As the town manager had mentioned, um, we're very excited to be working with Tecton. They've been outstanding to work with over this past year. Um, one of the advantages, uh, just so the board knows, um, with selecting Tecton is that, especially when we're looking at a public safety complex, um, the needs of police and fire, although we share a similar mission, the needs are vastly different. And one of the advantages of, of working with Tecton is they actually uh, partner with an architectural firm, uh, Pacheco Ross, out of New York. So what you have in Tecton is an architectural firm that has 30 years of designing police stations. Pacheco Ross has 30 years of designing fire stations. And when they work on these public safety complexes, they have a partnership and come together. Um, so you don't have a single architect that is, is sort of favoring one side or the other when it comes to design perspective. And that's a tremendous asset um, to, to us and to the committee when we're talking about the potential design of this building. Uh, so tonight, I would like to introduce um, Jeff McElravey, who who is the uh, uh, principal and owner of Tecton Architects. Uh, next to him is Matt Salad, uh, one of the engineers with Tecton, and then Dennis Ross from Pacheco Ross. Uh, so I will turn it over to these gentlemen, however they want to proceed in what order. Um, presentation will be up on the screen here, so I will turn it over to them. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chief. Um, thank you, Julie, uh, board, for inviting us to come speak with you tonight. Um, and I'd also like to thank both the fire police departments and the public safety facility advisory committee um, for allowing us to collaborate with them on this on this process. It's it's been a great um, effort over the past year to really get to know the community in both of these departments and really help assist them in in determining what's best moving forward um, for this community. Um, our team, uh, as mentioned, uh, Jeff McElravey, Dennis Ross, uh, Rebecca Hopkins, who's not with us today, is a number member of the Tecton team that participated uh, in-house in this project, uh, and myself, um, and then the various, uh, the advisory committee, as well as um, other folks in town who were, were instrumental in, in uh, going through this process. Um, I'm going to give a sort of brief overview of sort of where we've come over the past year, um, and then Dennis and I are going to speak um, specifically to the deficiencies with the existing buildings and, and why the recommendation had come to move forward with a different solution rather than renovating and adding on to what you have currently. So we looked at both three, uh, all three of the sites, the police headquarters, fire headquarters, and the West Station, and we looked at uh, a lot of the deficiencies as far as the building, the site, and where they are located within the town and their ability for the um, emergency responders to respond out of those sites. With this, we looked at issues with FEMA, flooding, um, we looked at uh, wetlands, ability to expand on these properties, <coughs> and how we can project the, the uh, buildings to be expanded over the next 50 years and into the future, because we can't fall into the same trap of designing a building that's gonna last the town another 20 years. We really wanna look for the next 50 to 75 years to make sure that the town is investing their funds appropriately um, moving forward. So we spent a lot of time early on working with both departments, various members of, of fire and police, dispatchers, uh, anybody and everyone we could, we could speak with, and going through a very detailed space needs analysis, understanding what has been, what they have currently, how they use these spaces that they currently have, and what they really need to perform their functions, functions effectively and efficiently now, and project that out over the next 50 years. In this, we really took a deep dive in understanding the way each department specifically works, um, and then we balance that against uh, national and local trends of modern public safety facilities using our own expertise to educate both departments into what sort of spaces can, can be utilized going, uh, going forward to maximize their efficiency and modernize their operations. 
from that initial set of ideas, concepts, and spaces, we, we spent several months refining all of that down. So it wasn't really just taking the wants of every depart of both departments, but really getting down to the needs to make sure that we, they weren't really overreaching in being efficient in, in, in their ask. In, in this way, we're sort of leveraging the most value for, the, for this process moving forward because it's not just grabbing anything they can take, it's really making sure that they have an efficient program that's gonna give a, a better value to the town when it starts to become an actual building. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the deficiencies of each facility um, as they stand. Um, a little bit of history on the, the first fire uh, police headquarters, which was on Southbridge Street in 1970, and then the new uh, location, uh, which opened in 2000. Uh, this is just uh, some historical images from the original police station, and I think if you, just by looking at some of the computers and paperwork and things like that, you can see sort of how policing has changed over the years. Um, this is vastly different in how they uh, you, uh, uh, operate within these buildings now than, than they used to operate back in you know, the 70s and 80s. And, and even in 2000, we, we really couldn't forecast the amount of technology that goes into these facilities today. And so that's something that's always at sort of the top of mind when we're programming these and, and trying to understand how the departments are gonna work in the future because if we can sort of plan for the, what technology is, is coming up, we can sort of maximize the ability for these facilities to be adapted. Um, so the existing building's a wood frame building, um, 5B construction, uh, the lower level is, is uh, masonry. Um, and it was sort of built for the size of the department at that time, and it wasn't really forecasting out the growth of the department in the future. So between 1991 and 2019, this is sort of a takeoff of, of the police department staffing. And as you can see, over the past 30 years, there's been a 330% increase in that staff. Um, you'll, you'll notice if you start to compare other local towns of, this, of similar size, their police departments are actually a little bit smaller. And a lot of that is due to the Route 12 corridor and, the 20, and, and Route 20. You just have more traffic, you have more activity, you have the Auburn Mall, so there's more need for more officers based on the, uh, the amount of calls and, and, and things like that that happen in town. If you've ever driven by the police department, one of the first things you'll notice out on site is the parking is at its capacity. There's hardly enough parking on site for just the officers and their, their vehicles, let alone visitors that are coming and in, 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 um, interacting with the police. Uh, this is an uh, aerial showing that there's overflow parking actually going across the street. And one of the issues with this site is based on its shape, it's sort of a crescent-shaped, very narrow site. You can, it's, it's bound by, by two roads to the north and south. And to the, to the other ends of the site where it pinches down, it's surrounded by wetlands, so there's really no expansion uh, capacity on this property um, in any direction for additional parking or for construction. And just to show the, the amount of people that actually visit the, the police department from the public, they, they see on average 8,000 visitors annually uh, in, into, this, into this police department. And the lobby is the first place that most people interact with, with the police. It's one small room. And it should be noted that there's a lot of different people that enter this lobby that, to interact with the dispatchers. There's people making re records requests. There's a general public that are coming in to make complaints um, to the police. There's also sex offenders that are registering. And so you have a lot of um, interaction between different use groups that you may not wanna have. And there's no means for those different um, groups of people to be separated as the department is currently. Uh, this is a couple of images of the dispatch center and some of the comm equipment. Um, there's a lot of technology and there's a lot of data that gets transmitted through a, uh, communication centers nowadays. Um, there's a lot of servers and uh, secure server space that, that is required to make sure that a lot of that data is safe. Um, and there's a lot of standards that dictate um, emergency communications, for in particular NFPA 1221, which requires a number of things, one of which being a two-hour fire separation between the dispatch center, the communications equipment, and the rest of the facility. Uh, the intent here is that if there's any um, emergency or natural disaster that happens in town, the lights need to be on and this facility needs to be operational so that dispatchers can speak to the rest of the emergency responders and, and allow them to respond out into the, into the public. Uh, record storage, 
there's a lot of records that need to be maintained for 7, 20, and, um, and even longer. So the, a lot of these records uh, are required for on-demand requests from the public, but a lot of them also need to be retained um, down the road. So there's a lot of paper records that are, that are stored in these facilities. This is just a portion of it, and it's, it's, we're just completely maxed out of space. Um, this is more record storage throughout the facility and some evidence storage. Um, uh, one of the issues you'll see here is uh, there's actually a large commercial dehumidifier in the lower level. One of the issues with the, with the police department as it stands is um, there's a problem with the slab and moisture mitigation. So they're constantly dehumidifying the space where the records are stored and where the evidence is stored. This obviously can lead to mold propagation throughout the facility and it can also lead to a lot of these records and, and, and pieces of evidence that are being maintained for long periods of time to degrade and become destroyed. Um, and so pieces of evidence that are being held for long periods of time because of unsolved and unresolved cases may become a large issue going into the future. Uh, and then this is some of the evidence storage. A lot of these pieces of, of, of evidence need to be maintained for very long periods of time and some forever. And so they're completely out of space there. And, and again, there's issues with moisture. There's issues on this lower level with flooding. They had a sewage backup just a couple of weeks ago. And, and you can see that some of this evidence has to be stored on the floor. And so it's very um, susceptible to damage. There's a lot of um, inadequate locker spaces. You can see how jammed full all these lockers are. Um, a lot of this equipment, um, it's kind of like your, your kid's hockey equipment coming back. It's very, you know, it's, it's out on a long hot day and it's out in the sun and, and uh, there needs to be proper ventilation for these lockers. Normally we actually tie the lockers into an actual um, uh, duct system. So it's actually exhausting a lot of those fumes. So they're not, um, again, creating mold and other issues within the facility. And the mechanical equipment is also an issue. It's outdated. Um, the generators are too close to the building, which poses a fire risk. And um, this louver right here is actually on the lower level, and it's, it's at the bottom of a hill. And basically, all day long, all year, leaves and dust and debris blow into that. And that's the main intake for all the um, fresh air that goes into the building. And it's continuously clogged and requires a lot of maintenance. The Sally Port is the first place where prisoners are brought into a police station. Um, as you can see from these images, there's, there's many issues, one of which is you can't open the cruiser doors uh, without hitting a wall or a column. So taking a prisoner that's combative out of a cruiser and getting them into the cells is an issue. The Sally Port also has storage within it, so that can be something that a prisoner can get a hold of and use as a weapon or, or, or hold themselves as they're being detained. And if a prisoner ever needs to um, have medical attention, ideally you can get an ambulance into the Sally Port, a stretcher rolled out, and that way you can get that prisoner onto the stretcher and into the ambulance in a secure environment. Currently, the ambulance won't fit into the, into the Sally Port, so they have to actually take the prisoner out into the parking lot. Uh, the prisoner processing area in the cells, this is where intake happens, breathalyzer tests, this is where uh, inmate, uh, prisoners are fingerprinted and their mug shots are taken. Um, there's a lot of technology that goes into here and there's a lot of um, issues with the current design as far as only one prisoner is able to be detained and, and processed at one time. There could be a time where there's three or four different prisoners being um, that, that need to be processed simultaneously. So there's no proper holding facilities until somebody is, is, is processed. Um, and then just the general um, makeup of the processing desk is, is plastic laminate. It's, it's not a strong, sturdy material. It can actually be um, broken apart and used as a weapon if a detainee was to get a hold of that. Um, and then there's issues with the cells. Um, they're, they're just sort of just barely passing DPH requirements, Department of Public Health, so they, they, they need attention just, just to maintain that. Um, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Dennis, who's gonna talk a little bit about fire headquarters in the West Station. Which is my special button, this one? Yep. Great, good evening, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna talk in the same tone that Matt has about certain deficiencies, but we're gonna carry it into a few different uh, directions. First of all, just like the police, the fire um, has seen a vast increase in number of calls over the years, as you can see, and those total calls, at least based on national averages, don't come down, they continue to rise, and I'm assuming they will continue to rise at about the same rate. One of the reasons is Fire is doing more and different types of response. 
you know, you think of your fire department, hey, they answer fire calls. Well, they do. And they answer hazmat calls, and they answer emergencies, and they answer roadway calls, and they assist the police, and they do many, many other things, and it's always increasing. So what, you know, the calls are increasing. When the calls increase, the apparatus and the equipment they carry on that apparatus becomes different types of uh, equipment. All right. <coughs> also, the way the fire department works is they are also on shifts. All right, so you have paid folks who actually show up for their shift. You have shift change where they overlap, so you're gonna have parking issues where one shift come in, comes in, the other shift may still be cleaning up, uh, getting ready to leave, but there will be some overlap and you have to account for that in, in both space and parking. Um, and you can see the original fire headquarters on top. A second floor was added, uh, I believe, in the 80s. Um, actually, it was added in 1995, excuse me. Um, and there was some renovation done a couple of years ago. Uh, but you can see the equipment, and if you take a hard look at, you know, what was there back, you know, in the 50s, it was very different than what you see today. Obviously, there's a size and a weight difference. perfect example. If you look at these pieces of equipment and you look at the doors behind them, you go, all right, how do we get those things in there? Uh, it's not easy. Um, not that they're bad drivers, but, you know, it often happens you're going to take out a mirror or set a lights on top of a fire truck, all right? You'd be astounded at what it costs to replace that stuff. Um, Another thing, if you look down in the corner, uh, Tower 1, you can see how close it gets to the street before it can actually pull out of the station. All right, for safety reasons, and so you don't knock your building down, you want that piece of fire apparatus completely out of the building before it addresses the street and makes a turn. Um, that's far too close. All right, that's just not a safe situation. Uh, we recommend nationally for a minimum of 60 feet, and that's to the property line, not to the street. Uh, this at best is about 40, so quite short. Uh, you can see that, that, you know, we're sharing parking. We obviously have site constraints. You can see the amount of trailers that are stored outside, so they're uh, subject to weathering, um, degradation and it would be lovely to get those things inside and protected because there's quite an investment in there. Um, you know, we can list them all, but it's for emergency management, special ops, <clears throat> different kinds of response, homeland security, and safe trailers, and getting that equipment inside would be a, a very good thing. So the site itself, as Matt had mentioned, we have the Auburn Pond, the building is shown, outlined up in the corner on Auburn Street. Um, the pond poses a problem in that it does flood, it does project itself, if you can see this blue line out here with the striping. That's actually a floodplain, all right? And there's some pretty hard and fast rules from FEMA about building emergency <coughs> facilities in a floodplain, specifically fire stations. FEMA comes up with what they call ADG and safer grants every year to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. If you build a new fire station or renovate a station willingly in a fire, in a floodplain like this, you are no longer eligible for those FEMA grants. They'll cut you off. So it speaks volumes to not want to actually rebuild or renovate here in a floodplain. Uh, as you can see, we'll go through the building quickly. Uh, the lobby, uh, far less than what even the police have. Um, it needs to be used as a safe haven. Uh, there's no seating. Um, it, it's just far too small for a public building and doesn't serve its purpose conference room has been diminished in order to make room for a uh, deputy chief's office. Uh, we met many times in here. It was extremely crowded, uh, very difficult to use, uh, but they have made do with what they have. 
Again, just like Matt showed with the police, we have understair storage, which by the way violates building codes in Massachusetts, uh, but there's absolutely nowhere else to store stuff. And you can see they've got files, <coughs> um, other kinds of storage that, that they need room for. This is the one that concerns me because this is actually a life safety issue. Um, when you see apparatus this close to the doors and this close to each other, uh, imagine an 80,000 pound vehicle moving with a firefighter or firefighters next to it or actually up against it. Uh, they don't stand a chance. <clears throat> All the clearances around, above, behind, in front are far, far too close to walls, other apparatus. I mean, it's just a very unsafe situation. Recommendation, believe it or not, for the uh, minimum distance in there would be uh, six to eight feet. That's about two and a half. Uh, another thing we have is they don't have a place to properly store or dry their gear. You can see different types of gear. Um, just so you know, that Auburn is probably paying somewhere around uh, $3,000 for a set of uh, basic fire gear and that does not include your hat, your gloves, or your boots. All right, and that's just basic. <clears throat> so. You're trying to dry this stuff, clean it, decontaminate it in a situation where you're hanging it on ladders. Um, this is not how you want to treat you know, $8,000 worth of gear. And it needs to be decontaminated, and I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, obviously, again, storage. You can see up on the mezzanine, if you want to call it that, they're putting stuff wherever they can. The West Street Station, and I think I said this in my last presentation, is pretty much going to be the same type of thing. This was a school building. It was converted. Um, it was never meant for the kind of hard use it gets. Um, any one of these engines probably weighs anywhere from 40 to 50,000 pounds. Fill it up with water, park it in on a little four-inch slab, and it'll crack the slab. Uh, it just wasn't meant for this kind of use. Um, building is completely deteriorated and you can see how they're parking it doesn't even fit in there and again they have all the same space issues clearance issues height issues um, as as the main station again storage and locker area uh, again you know you're mistreating um, gear you don't have any gender equity in your locker room um, People are, you know, piled up on each other. And again, you can see, you know, we have a motorcycle parked in here along with tool storage, along with gear drying. Um, so they're just working on top of each other on everything here. So this is what I really want to talk about quickly is some trends. <coughs> That's going to go into police trends, and then I'm going to talk about fire trends. So we talked about the lobby a little bit earlier and some of the issues they have here. Um, some of the spaces that come off of a modern public safety uh, police station lobby is going to be training rooms, a community room, licensing, permitting, records request area, um, dispatch area. And they all need to be um, adequately positioned off of this lobby in a way that's clear and legible to the public and it also needs to be a welcoming space to the public because this is this is where they're interacting with the police the most and, it, and they, you don't really want it to be a negative space when they first interact with the police and understanding that again the different use groups that, that, that come into the space and, and having a way for them to be organized so that you're not dealing with a child and their mother and a, and a sex offender that's registering um, Proper community training in emergency operations centers are, are critical, making sure that they have all of the technology that's needed for the different departments to come into this space and utilize it during, during an emergency. And this is also used for inner office uh, training. So this can be utilized by both police or fire, but can also be used for other police departments and fire departments from around the Commonwealth to come in and utilize for specific training seminars. Um, some internally run by the departments and some also um, by the various policing and, and fire organizations. 
modern communication space, making sure that the dispatch center has enough space so that all of these monitors can be readily available and accessible by, by the dispatchers. They're dealing with a lot of technology. They're not just taking your call when, when, in a, when you dial 911. They're typically also dealing with most of the town security systems in, in, in all of their video surveillance. Um, as well as the surveillance and security throughout the building itself. So these are, these are the, the eyes on the streets for, for the community. So making sure they have good access to all of these things, but also making sure they're comfortable. There's a lot of issues with PTSD um, with dispatchers, so making sure that they have a safe, comfortable space because sometimes they get some very disturbing calls and are dealing with some very troubling situations and they have to be cool, calm, and collect when they're talking to, to these people over the phone to make sure that they're keeping them calm while at the same time dispatching the first responders that are going to re remedy the situation. And then making sure that officers have modern, open, comfortable spaces so they can perform their work efficiently and adequately. It's not just jumbled pieces of paper everywhere, it's, it's thoughtfully designed spaces that allow them to execute each of their tasks in an efficient manner because if they're able to do their jobs better within the department, they can better um, respond to the community. Um, proper evidence processing, interview rooms, making sure that the chain of custody is, is intact for, for any evidence that's coming into a police station, making sure that it goes from an officer to an evidence officer and stays in storage so that it's not getting passed between a bunch of different hands, which would then invalidate that evidence when it goes to trial. And then making sure that the sally port is a good space that an ambulance can get into and that an officer can be protected while transporting a prisoner into the station itself. And then finally, the prisoner areas themselves, making sure they're clean, efficient spaces that are safe, again, for the officers and for the prisoners, making sure that the booking and intake process is efficient, clean, and safe. There's a lot of people coming in that, that um, may want to do harm, and we need to make sure that there's a place that they can be detained in a way where they're able to calm down until they're ready to be properly booked and handled by an officer. And then their uh, lawyers and, and bail clerks and things like that can then enter the facility and, and, and manage them from that point forward. Uh, and now Dennis is gonna talk a little bit about fire trends quickly and then we're gonna just touch on the budget. Um, one of the big things that we really wanna talk about here is the health and wellness, all right? Um, this is nothing but a red list of things we don't use in buildings and unfortunately your buildings are full of them. More importantly, this is what I really want to talk about, is what we're looking for is indoor environmental quality to take care of sleep deprivation, cancer prevention, uh, look after their physical and mental <coughs> health, and a holistic approach to design. So what does all that really mean? It means that when we look at the current station, and we look at cancer prevention, and we look at the things that we need to do to keep firefighters and police officers um, healthy and clean, all right, you know, in our professional determination, those existing buildings cannot be made to do that, all right? We do have the power architecturally to design ways in to do these things, but to take the building that exists and do that, there is really no way to do it. And you can see we're looking at decontamination, uh, resiliency, cancer awareness. Cancer awareness is more, it's really cancer prevention, uh, health and safety, flexible training. We need gender equity, uh, ADA accessibility. We have what we call hot <laughs> and cold zone transitions. That's going from contaminated areas to clean or clean to contaminated. Um, sustainability uh, and managing mental health again. And if you doubt the seriousness of the cancer and the, um, the issues involved, uh, if you look way down in the corner, tomorrow morning I am sitting on the NFPA Council uh, for Emergency Responder Occupational Health. I believe I'm the only architect in the country sitting on that. And we are actually rewriting the NFPA rules, which is National Fire Prevention Association rules and regulations on how to actually operate within your fire station. Um, so we're talking about proper decontamination, proper lockers, um, different forms of decontamination up in the corner. That's a proper way to dry uniforms using a piece of equipment like that and getting through and then just all the other spaces, lockers, bunk rooms, I wanna do this quickly, admin spaces, 
and then back to Matt. Um, and so one of the last pieces is um, redundancy and resiliency. Um, again, these, these as, as mentioned before, these facilities need to be in operation during the worst of times. So the last place for the lights to go down is gonna be your, your police and fire stations. So making sure that the mechanical systems are robust enough and have redundancies built in. So if any piece of equipment fails, that the facility can still operate. Uh, we're required to have the facility on backup generator with an uninterruptible power supply for a minimum of 72 continuous hours. So if there is something like the October snowstorm, our Superstorm Sandy that comes through, there needs to be enough uh, fuel in that generator to run that facility for 72 hours, in which time we can plan for another backup system in case we don't have source power uh, restored. And then consolidation of departments. We, um, Kevin had touched on that we're, that we're looking at potentially consolidating three departments into a single facility. These are some of the, the spaces that you eliminate um, having in each building and in, in, under a consolidation. So a single fitness center, a single lobby space, a single training area in EOC, and a reduction in your mechanical uh, systems because they're all sort of combined into one single plant. So with that, we're gonna to touch briefly on the budget. Um, we we tip, took these numbers essentially from the space needs assessments we had done, one for each separate facility, and then one for a joint combined public safety facility, and we'll show sort of the delta and the cost of that. These are prices that are escalated to uh, midpoint of construction, assuming uh, 2023 spring. Um, and so that's sort of when we're, we're looking to sort of track this project out, and that's where it sort of falls into the, in line with the schedule that you have in your packet. Um, these, are, these numbers are based on today's values and, and an average cost per square foot for what we see nationally and what we see in the Commonwealth for police stations, fire stations, and joint public safety facilities. This is solely based on the square footage from the space needs and those numbers that we see across the Commonwealth. So um, the numbers could go up and they could go down based on site constraints, what we have existing that we have to deal with, the design of the building and its efficiency. So we have some sort of contingencies built into these numbers that allow some flexibility as we dive into the design, which is sort of the next phase of the process. Again, so we're assuming um, midpoint of construction, spring of 2023. Um, just, to, just as a point of reference, uh, construction cost escalation on average outpaces inflation, which is in about 2%. Construction cost escalation averages three to six and a half percent. And right now we're sort of in that higher end of escalation right now because of the way that the construction market is. It's just sort of saturated with the work at this time. So the standalone police headquarters, um, based on the space needs assessment, we're looking at, an, a, at a projected project cost um, of around $23 million. Um, this is a full project cost, so this isn't just construction, this is fees and, and all the soft costs associated. Uh, standalone fire headquarters is around $18 million. And then if we were to do a standalone fire substation for the needs uh, today, um, it would be about $8.8 .8 million. Um, so that's a total facilities cost of around $50 million for all three facilities. Again, this is assuming spring 2023 of all of them at the same time. It would be assumed that these probably would, would phase out over 20 years or so. So um, as time goes on, again, escalation factors would, would have to apply and, and those numbers could certainly go up. Um, and then here's a, a detailed cost analysis of what we had done for the joint public safety facility. So, so this shows more of a breakout of sort of all the line items that we address when we look at these cost, item, uh, cost estimates. These are built into those first numbers. This is sort of how we, we, we look at these on a per square foot basis. And if we were to look at a single um, public safety facility combined, we're looking at just under $40 million based on what we have programmed right now for the total project cost. Um, and if you want, we can get more into the weeds of some of these, some of these line items, but um, I think really the main point is that by combining all these three facilities into a single um, building, we're looking at a, today, uh, a 2023 net savings of uh, $10.5 million as opposed to doing all three separately. And then there's some, of course, the life cycle um, savings as well for maintaining and operating that building over the next 20 to 50 years um, based on its, its maintenance schedule. Um, and I think with that, we'll just open it up to any questions and apologize for running a little long. It's a lot of information to cover. 
not long at all, actually, very, very good pace. Mrs. Jacobson, do you have anything else? Uh, through the chair, I would just ask uh, Kevin Kennedy if there, uh, if you want to expound on any of the recommendations now that we've seen this. No, I think uh, based on the Tecton's presentation, uh, I think it's appropriate for any questions for the from the board. Okay. Board members, have any questions? Mrs. Goodrich. Thank you. Um, through you to Chairman Kennedy. Um, first of all, thank you for the work you and your committee have done on this. Um, my questions are um, specific to the sites. I know that you've looked at several sites and in your presentation, you have two sites that are in consideration and the recommendation is to pursue the acquisition of these sites. Um, and I've watched your meetings too. Um, what have the discussions been on um, sites if these two sites don't work out for whatever reason, you know, the, you're, they're unaffordable or the, you know, specifically the Sears, um, which I think is a great site, unable to, to cut it up properly. Um, are you confident that you've addressed every site within the town, presented it to us, and these are the only two suitable sites? Well, I'll, I'll let the town manager talk a little bit about the uh, um, sort of the directions relative to proposals and putting out. So I think we've sort of made a determination of where our uh, res range would be in terms of sites for uh, response times. Uh, we've also sort of made determinations on rough estimates through Tecton as to what uh, size of the site would be necessary to properly accommodate. So that sort of limits us um, as to the sites that were available. Those two sites that we presented are one is on the market, the old Yankee Drummer site, and the Sears site appears to be going through a, a change as we speak uh, with closing of, of the Sears property. Um, that's not to say there aren't potential, if there could be something else out there in that corridor. Some of the other sites that we looked at that weren't ideal, um, certainly if those two sites didn't come to fruition, I think uh, you know we could go back to the committee and say what else would be, um, less than ideal, uh, the things to, to look at again. Uh, but those were the two that sort of uh, presented themselves, were reviewed, met the size requirements, the availability requirements. Um, so I, I hope that answers your... Chairman, if I may just follow up and maybe reward that a little bit. So um, let me just start by saying we, we've been through this process before with the schools, and the most important thing is for your committee to be able to go out and, and, and talk to the voters about this and the residents who, who will, we will ultimately need support. And in the 11th hour of getting close to this vote, I don't want it to be thrown out there that um, well, have you looked at this? Oh, have you looked at that? Um, I guess my direct question is, you're confident that you've looked at the sites that will adequately support a public safety complex and um, your committee's done that work already? Those two sites that we've identified would meet all of the needs for a public safety complex. And I'm sure there, there are gonna be folks that are gonna come to us and say, you know, we like the you know the Shaw's site. Should that become available, or we like uh, you know uh, other pieces of property? Um, but those two sites that we've identified will meet all our needs. It appears that they are going to be commercially available sites uh, uh, that the town can look at, uh, into going through the appropriate um, acquisition process to look at those sites uh, potentially. Um, and certainly, yes, if anybody came, we could certainly discuss some of the shortcomings. Shaw's would be a great site. You know, uh, you know, it's those parking lots are utilized for school functions as well. However, it just comes just outside of that response area that puts it just a little bit further um, north on Route 12. Uh, not by much, Sears isn't yeah. just down the road, but it just put itself out a little bit where we'd have to start talking about maybe peeling off uh, a sub staff, a sub fire station for West Auburn to kind of keep those response times where we wanted them. Um, so there is certainly, if those two sites that we identified didn't come to fruition, certainly we'd have to kind of go back a little bit to the drawing board and uh, see where things were at that time. I hope that answers. Uh, 
It absolutely does, and just to just to finish up, um, I live on, um, on in West Auburn, which is almost to the Oxford line. So I appreciate um, through the chief and you the the efforts that been have been made to ensure that um, the response times are appropriate. You know, having having needed those emergency services, I know what what those. Um, times mean, so um, thank you for always keeping those in consideration. You're all set? I am, thank you. Okay. Any other board members have a question? I do have a, a comment um, in looking at <coughs> the facilities and having worked at a couple of the facilities, um, yeah, I'm completely in agreement with the fact that none of the facilities are sufficient to uh, to go forward, um, and very much in favor of a single facility. Um, but also, I, I, I want to keep uh, in mind when designing um, our new facility and, and our, uh, whatever property we choose is that, you know, Auburn is a very, very centrally located uh, town and is gonna be very attractive for, uh, you know, police seminars, fire seminars, and things like that, trainings. So when we, when we take into consideration uh, the new facility and the new uh, property, um, that we, we also want to make ourselves a bit marketable um, in that hopefully, you know, we can generate some revenue by, you know, if there's, um, you know, need for a, a police academy course or something that, that we can possibly also uh, make a little bit by us utilizing our facilities, utilizing our hotels in town um, to have a convention or something like that. Um, you know, K-9 is becoming very big, so make sure that we have, um, you know, a, a bit of a, a area for, for K-9 training and that type of thing. Um, so uh, I'm excited to see uh, some of the new things that, that are coming along, and I just definitely want to keep in mind that, you know, we're going to be an attractive uh, community for uh, many things to come, and, and we want to market ourselves a little bit as well to, to bring in income as well as utilize and, and, and have, you know, the most modern and, and best facilities uh, in the area. So that's just a comment, not, not uh, any critique or anything from anything that you've done. So I appreciate all the work that's been done and I'm excited to see what, uh, what comes down in the future. Anything else from board members, Ms. Liberty? Uh, through the chair. So I just had one question that jumped out at me when I was watching the presentation. Um, so to Tecton, um, the, uh, with the police station in regards to records keeping, um, is it a mass law, uh, just out of curiosity, that requires the public records be kept uh, on paper as well as, as digital? I mean, I mean, I would assume that that's, that's why they take up so much space. Uh, yes, there are Massachusetts laws that require the retention of, of certain types of materials. Um, there has been um, a trend in policing throughout the country to start getting the ability to digitize more and more documents, um, but even in that case, there are still a lot of documents today that are still required to be retained in paper form. Uh, what's the, sorry, I, yes, of course. What's the longest, um, that you're aware of uh, for a, a paper document or some indefinite, I'm sure. In an open uh, case, particularly a homicide case, you could, you could have to retain it indefinitely. Thank you. Anything else, okay. Anything else from the committee or from the town administration or Chief Coleman? Uh, through the chair, yes, I'd like to just uh, follow up and clarify <clears throat> the process for acquisition. Should the uh, decision be made to move forward on something like this? So, <clears throat> first of all, I want to thank the committee for all the work they did. It's a tremendous amount of research and evaluation and analysis, and thanks uh, to Tecton. And also, have to wish uh, Matt and Dennis from Tecton happy birthday because it is their both of their birthdays today. <laughs> 
<laughs> they've chosen to share it with us, so thank you. <laughs> Wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so I, I, I think it just, so the public understands how this would happen. So there are three different mechanisms for property acquisition for a municipality. Uh, and, and this is probably in the order of, of preference. The first one would be under a uh, Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 30B, Procurement of Land, which would be to put out an RFP for land for the development of a public safety facility, and at that you would develop the criteria to be within the boundaries of the area that has been determined to be the best response time. And you would ask for proposals that met all of your criteria, and any property owner in that area of which we need to stay would be eligible to put a bid in for either a lease or a sale that has to be determined. The, so the town cannot just go and approach a property owner uh, under that scenario and just say we'd like to negotiate a, a price with you. We have to go through a process. Uh, the second way to do that is through special legislation, which is very time consuming, it's lengthy, and uncertain as to when it would happen and if it would happen because you're seeking the legislative body to approve of special legislation. So that's not a guarantee that you would actually get that, uh, but that would allow the town to direct negotiate with a specific property owner. <coughs> and the third mechanism is eminent domain. Eminent domain, uh, again, is most likely the most costly and time consuming of all three methods. Uh, under eminent domain, you still have to pay market rate, you have to get appraisals, there's opportunities for the property owner to appeal your decision and your, your purchase price, in which case you have to get additional appraisals and you could end up in court and it could be very costly. So at this point, if we were to proceed in consultation with town council, uh, Ed Casanova to myself have spoken to him, it's um, we would recommend the best process would be the Chapter 30B RFP process for soliciting proposals. So uh, I just wanted to make that clear. There is a timeline in your packet, and Matt, I want to thank him for his help on that. This really, as I said, there's a number of step on, uh, steps that need to be uh, gone through, but it would be just moving forward through the chair, it would be our recommendation that this is the initial meeting that the Board of Selectmen has had to see all this information. The committee has had several meetings. We've been meeting since uh, early September, and they've done a yeoman's amount of work in that time. I think it would be important for the board to consider holding a number of public meetings and public hearings, and we would recommend joint meetings with the Board of Selectmen and the Finance Committee, at least to start discussing this and start to discuss the budget and the financial impacts of this, and then maybe after a couple of those meetings, have a couple of additional public hearings. I've laid out a timeline here. If the board is seeking to do this and to put it on the November, the upcoming November election, the Secretary of State requires that communities to place a local ballot question on a national election, it's a state election for a national for a national uh, election, that we would have to get it to the Secretary of State on the first Wednesday in August, which this year is August 5th. So if you back that up for the board to take a vote to put the question on the ballot, you would have to take that vote by July 13th or probably at the latest July 27th based on your schedule or somewhere in between there, just to make sure that we get it there by the 5th. Then if you flash forward on the time chart, in November, presumably you would have a ballot question for a debt exclusion. Then after that, the board would have to take a vote to establish a special town meeting. That would most likely happen in January of 2021, so we're looking a year ahead. Once town meeting and the voters approve of the debt exclusion and approve of the appropriation to move forward, at that time, you could begin to put your RFP out to solidify which site you're going to go on. Once you know what site it is, it's at that point that the design can start. The design really can't start prior to that because the design at this point will be specific to a site. And without knowing that site, we don't want to start the design. So then there's a process for the design, there's a process for the preparation of bid docs, then there's going out to bid for construction, contract, contract award, and if you carry this forward, we were looking somewhere around August of 2022 
for the start of construction uh, with an end date of December of 2023. So that, again, all of this can be flexible, but there are some specific limitations specifically with regard to getting it on a November ballot. Of course, if you wanted to have a special election, that is an option. It's something that the board could consider. We just thought we would put it out there for the earliest possible vote would probably be the November election. So our recommendation would be for the board to continue these conversations, uh, to likely set up a couple of meetings with the finance committee as we had done with the middle school project. There were some joint meetings, uh, one or two joint meetings, probably uh, important to do that. And then maybe in May and June, hold some meetings for the public to see this information. There's a lot, as Matt said, you got all this into a quick presentation tonight, which we appreciate because we had asked you to do that. But I think over time, there's a lot more information that we want to make sure the public has before uh, any of you make an informed decision, you need to have the data. And the data exists, they've got all the information that we've asked them to provide under the scope of services. So I think moving forward, we just need to continue to have public meetings to talk about this. <coughs> um, along with that uh, comment on data in future meetings, and I don't want to address it tonight uh, by getting any answers from anybody, but uh, obviously, you know, my uh, first thought is when I look at uh, a new $40 million facility is, you know, how much can we recover from the old facilities uh, by a resale value and that type of thing. Um, you know, the Randall School, uh, is not only just a fire head or, or a fire uh, sub uh, station, but it's also a uh, school uh, building. So, um, would we not be able to, uh, you know, resell uh, that building because the school is there? Um, as far as the fire headquarters, we're talking about doing a whole revamping of the Drury Square area. So, do we uh, take into consideration that, you know, that might become a retail space and have some value there. So these are all things that I'm sure the public is going to want to hear uh, as far as recovery um, and, and help to pay some of this $40 million. Um, you know, obviously there's, there's grants and everything else that we're going to be going for. Um, but it's certainly something that uh, I think is going to be one of my first questions uh, going forward. Um, and again, not looking for any discussion tonight, but just something that, that I, I definitely would like to see uh, in, a, in a future presentation as to what we think we can recover from the existing properties. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Through the chair, if I can just add one thing, I, and I apologize, I should have added this before. When Ed and I uh, started to do this time frame, we were doing this with a keen eye to when the debt will be retired on the high school. So the debt will be retired on the high school in 2024. So we are allowed to then ban or short-term borrow for construction up to two years prior to the time you permanently uh, take a bond on it, which would be not before 2024. So that's why we want to make sure the construction schedule fell in with that 2022 area, because you could ban construction costs from 2022 to 2024. Then when the high school debt retires, you could take this up on it. Uh, that being said, there's still a delta between the amount of the high school debt and what this project would be. So I think there's absolutely a value to having future discussions on impact on taxpayers. Um, how do we structure the debt? How long do you structure the debt? And what type of impact that this would have based on your, your debt schedule? Can I see your hand up? I see good Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, so before we adjourn, I'm, I'm certainly not going to commit to the time table. So I'm just going to say that because in the past it's been said that the, the board had never said anything about it. So I'm not going to commit to your timetable. So I just want to get well, that through out the chair, this right. isn't, the, the, there is no way to commit to the timetable because the timetable is going to be fluid. Uh, this is, as I said, this is just a guidance to give everybody somewhat of an idea of what we're talking about here. This is a lengthy process. It's not going to be decided in one night, one month, uh, and maybe even uh, under, a, under a year. So this is nothing that anyone has to commit to. This is specifically just giving you some options and showing you best case scenario, how long will it take to get here? 
I just want to go on record that, just so that there's no confusion on my part that I'm not committing to any timetable tonight. Um, another question that I have, which similar to Mr. Berthium's is demolition cost. We're talking about saving $10 million, okay? Well, we have three buildings, potentially. What is the cost of that? I would like to see that figure, and that should be part of this discussion, because unlike with the schools, where we've been sitting for years on two schools, that thankfully, hopefully, we're nearing the end of the tunnel, I want us to have a glide path to what are we gonna do with these buildings, because if we wanna put money into programs, then we need to not have 10 buildings in town for this and that. So I'm all for putting money into programs and seeing us improve the working conditions of all employees. So I'm certainly not <coughs> mindful of, I've had the opportunity of touring the fire station a couple of times and the police station more than a few times. So I'm well aware of its challenges. So I'm certainly not making up my mind one way or the other tonight. So that is something that I would like to do and also would like to try and see uh, if we can do some tours of some buildings that are recently built that you may have done so that we can make sure that as we're evaluating this process that we learn from other communities, you know. Um, something as simple as, you know, not putting a light switch somewhere, and it just seems kind of silly, but I know in your presentation that the sally port there is something that somebody can get a hold of. And those type of things might seem minor and might seem beneath our review, but I think we definitely want to make sure that, you know, we don't want to put uh, the washers in a room without electric service, and we want to make sure that every tiny little detail that we can avoid any of the errors or oversights of the past are not repeated. And, and I'm very happy to hear that we're looking at 50 to 75 years because I'm not even 50 and we've already built two new police stations. So I don't think I'm gonna be around hopefully in 50 years. So, but I'm gonna give you the benefit of the doubt that hopefully this one's gonna last more than 20 years. So <laughs> it's awful expensive. <laughs> Mr. Kennedy, yes. Mr. Chairman, just uh, since two board members have brought it up, so we just had some very, you know, conversational levels as to the same just, uh, concerns about those yep. buildings. Um, and, and the police station, although it has outgrown its usefulness as a police facility and has some challenges for, for them, it's still structurally, and the architects can speak to that a little bit, is a you know is a viable building and there's been some talk that the school department uh, would be a good fit for that existing building. It's town owned. It's got the meeting space. It could be tele you know televised for their meetings, um, appropriate office space, uh, reception area. So that building in itself, we sort of in mind uh, relative to the other buildings and the uh, disposition of those. I can't answer that. Um, I would like to comment that both the police and fire chief were very receptive to having. Um, public tours of the, the building, so going forward, as you as you get public input, um, they were very receptive to that, and uh, yeah, I do applaud your idea that uh, as we get to that design phase, should the uh, the town go in that direction, that to look at uh, some of their other success stories um, that the architects have worked on through other communities. So if we're going to modify a building, that would be similar. How much is it gonna cost to take it from a jail to Maybe the superintendent would like to put some of the kids in jail, but I don't think they or she can. So what are we gonna have to do to modify it so that it's useful as well? So those are, because those are real costs, just like the costs that we bear on our schools, which we know we're going to get a good result out of it, but there's a little pain right now with the process, which is nobody's fault. So I'm not raising it for that point, just as an example. Chief, did you have something? You're at the microphone. I just wanted to let the board and the public know that this presentation that was delivered tonight is already on the town's website. So if they go to auburnguide.com on the home page on the news flash section, if they click there, they'll be able to see this full PowerPoint presentation. Thank you, Chief. And I know at uh, your public hearing, I did watch that prior to this meeting just so that I could kind of get a feel for what was going on. 
Um, both chiefs have said that the public can contact you to tour the buildings themselves. So, you know, members of the public should avail themselves of that opportunity to see the conditions and make an informed decision because it isn't just dollars and cents, obviously. it's how people are working, in what conditions, and you know, I happen to know that Mass General Law does actually give a presumption for cancer to firefighters, and that has been a long-standing Mass General Law. So it is something that has been acknowledged by the Commonwealth many, many years ago, whether we've caught up with the science to hopefully prevent that, that would be great. So with that, if nobody else has anything else, and the committee is good, We'll thank you again for staying and for all your hard work, and Happy New Year. Have a good night. Thank you,